Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories, and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. And we're back. How are you doing, Doro? I'm doing great. Can't wait to see how your class went yesterday. <laughs> yep, yep. Another another class with Daniel Sheehan and the New Paradigm Institute. Awesome. And uh, it was class number three. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got some uh, stuff to talk about there. Uh, there was also um, Daniel Sheehan was on News Nation because Ross Coltart as now a show on News Nation. I think it's called Reality Check. Okay. And he had a big interview with Daniel. And that was, it was actually pretty powerful because, um, because uh, he, Daniel basically said that uh, this past, well, let's see, within the, like two weeks ago, the uh, Arrow the Pentagon's group that's responsible for giving Congress a report on the history of UFOs back to 1947. They released their acronym for something. I don't mean to cut you off. I'm taking notes and I want to make sure I was that arrow. Is that an an acronym or is that actually like a bow and arrow spelling? Uh, I think it's a A R O it's a all domain anomaly resolution office. Okay. Office within the United States. Uh, it's a secretary of defense and, uh, yeah, they, and they just released their report, which had been due and everyone was really curious what this report would say. And basically the report was a big sham, basically another project blue book. They said there's basically no evidence of anything and they haven't had any reports from anyone about with any direct evidence or of, uh, information about any secret UFOs or technology being uh, in the possession of the U.S. military. Okay. Yeah. And so Daniel Sheehan said, uh, he basically went on Ross Coulthard's show and said uh, that Sean Kirkpatrick, who is responsible for that report, is lying, lying to Congress because yeah. Daniel Sheehan himself is revealing that he has direct evidence, uh, that he has seen direct evidence and that he reported it to Sean Kirkpatrick in person himself. Uh, He says when he was assigned by President Carter to research the uh, UFO phenomenon, he was given access in the National Archives to the classified uh, files of Project Blue Book, which when he went through it, he saw photographs of a crashed UFO, of a crash flying saucer, a silver disc. Um, I think it was in the snow. And uh, from this silver disc, he, that's the one he wrote down the symbols. He wrote down the, the symbols that were on it. Right, yeah. And he took took those to the Vatican and to see if they had any idea what they said. And um, so basically Daniel Sheehan said he that counts as direct, that's direct witness testimony. I mean, seeing a photograph of something is direct evidence in a court of law. That is considered direct um, as a firsthand witness. Boy, of evidence he reported tricky. that yeah well, uh, now with ai that's that's going to be harder and harder to determine what's a real photograph yeah yeah but i mean he's basically he's just saying that sean kirkpatrick lied to congress and yes and so he's making a really it's a really it's a very serious accusation i mean it's it's defamation um so if he's lying if if daniel sheehan was lying then sean kirkpatrick could sue him for defamation and but Basically, him and Ross Coulthard were talking about it, and they were basically like, please sue us then. Let's take this to a court of law because 
you, Mr. Sean Kirkpatrick, are lying to Congress. Let's bring the evidence forward. And uh, really, he's even challenging Congress to bring, you know, to subpoena Kirkpatrick and make him come and testify before Congress about this. Wow. So. Wow. Was this uh, was this the majority of your class? The the whole. Oh no no no! This was just oh. this just happened to. Uh, this happened the week before my class. I just thought it was interesting because. Uh, no, they set the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. So wild. the class. So this was class number three. And it was uh, legal implications of this whole uh, UFO cover up that's been going on, and he said. Uh, so basically, this is what we did. Uh, Daniel reviewed the eight basic scenarios of how this could set up from a legal perspective. And it, it basically, the, the legal implications of this UFO cover-up differ depending on what the truth is behind the cover-up. And um, so, like, the, the first scenario is the MJ-12 scenario, the Majestic 12 scenario, which is basically... That these uh, that there really are aliens, uh, the UFOs are real. The Roswell crash happened, and the uh, the story of Majestic Twelve is that after the Roswell crashed, they took the uh, crash vehicle to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Then President Truman created a secret committee of twelve people. This was concealed from Congress. And this secret group called Majestic 12 has been studying the phenomenon for years, looking for advantage to create full spectrum military dominance and probably some profiteering for themselves. And uh, so that's one scenario that wow. is the most popular in the UFO community and very commonly thought to be true. So but it's only Truman, one of eight. Tru I don't want to cut you off, but I got. I want to keep up with the details. So Truman put together the MJ-12, right? Yep, yep. And there's a document that came out many, many in the 80s or something that basically, you know, that the CIA claims is a fraud, but it basically it is the document that explains. It even lists the first 12 people that were on it, including okay, a guy yeah, named. I was going to ask well, who was on it. <laughs> yeah, there was a guy named uh, Forrestal who was the Secretary of Defense back then, who. Uh, mm -hmm eventually died by uh falling out a window from a uh from a uh, a hospital and they say that the story is that the CIA killed him because he was going to spill the beans and they made it look like a suicide out a window oh boy and that's a true thing he was secretary of defense and that's how he died so it's just a um but whether or not he was killed that's the theory right right Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's one. That's the one. That's the that's number one. And he yeah. said there would be eight, but we were all taking notes, and it looks like he only got to seven theories. But uh, mm. all right, so that's number one. And if and so I mean, if that's uh, if that one is true, then basically he said the legal implications are that MJ twelve is an illegal committee. You're not allowed by the Constitution to create some private committee outside of the oversight of Congress and give it authority over anything related to potential foreign adversaries or foreign invasions. And if aliens are real and they got ships, they count as a foreign adversary. And if their ships are landing in the U S those are, that's a potential foreign invasion. Wow. So he's like, it's uh so basically Truman started the constitutional problem immediately back then. So that's one legal framework for this. Wow. He's our, so the, yeah. the second, should I go to the next one? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the second one is he calls the Brown Brothers capitalist elite theory. And basically he's saying in this theory that the whole cover-up has basically been a, a bunch of corporate capitalist uh, uh, like robber barons, like the Rockefellers and uh, stuff. They were basically been hiding aliens and alien technology basically just to enrich themselves for decades so they're just so so it's like under this theory it's possible maybe mj12 doesn't even exist and this is just a corporate thing and it's just profiteering and the important difference is that would be a criminal racketeering enterprise that you'd have to handle through the justice system instead of if it's an mj12 scenario then congress would need to like 
uh, form a select committee like the church commission did back when the CIA was committing assassinations and stuff uh, back, I don't know, in the 70s or 80s, the church committee mm -hmm. did a big thing there. So anyways, so that's kind of the uh, the second theory is that this is a cap capitalist corporate um, the thing. Brown Brothers. Now, I've never heard of the Brown Brothers. I mean, I've heard of the Koch Brothers or the Koch Brothers, whatever you call them, and all these other. But yeah, this is a new name for me. I have not heard that before. Okay, yeah, and I can summarize this because he went. The details of this are that this he calls it the private Brown Brothers Harriman private corporate self interest conspiracy. That's kind of I like title. It's not. It's not a really good, great name, but he, but it's basically he says that. The theory is, the story is that even before MJ-12 was created, uh, that during, or I get at the end of World War II, a secret treasure uh, hoard was found in the Philippines. And this treasure hoard had $1.2 trillion in gold, silver, platinum, and diamonds, and fine jewels. And it was oh hidden in these like oil barrels in the Philippines. Mm. And Truman... And some guy named Stinson, uh, when they were notified of this, they basically squirreled it away and they put it into a private trust called the Anderson Trust. And oh this my. Anderson Trust of $1.2 trillion worth of stuff back then has been used ever since to fund covert operations and to basically serve the interests of the group that's been in control of this trust which is basically a group of private individuals ever since then. And, and he's basically saying that this is like maybe MJ 12 still was created, but this was before it. It's really, this is where it was a corporate, uh, you know, basically Truman committed a crime, taking that hoard of money, giving it to this private trust rather than claiming it for the U S government. And um, so, so this is basically, that's the basically second scenario. And he said it, this would be a, um, Oh, wait, sorry, my notes go on. He hmm. says, so this trust was created, and then he says Brown Brothers Harriman uh, is a private investment group, and it was a private investment group of the Carnegie's, Rockefellers, and other oh, robber barons. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, yeah, so let's see, and they, they've controlled it for profit, and he basically said this would be a a federal criminal racketeering operation, full on criminal conspiracy, and would require a massive criminal investigation of the Justice Department, not necessarily a select committee from Congress. That's the second theory. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, oh, I thought that. OK, so that was all the second theory. OK. Yeah, I mean, it kind of fits with the MJ-12. It just means that this corporate thing happened potentially before MJ-12. Right. Okay. okay. Ooh, three. <laughs> okay. The third one, um, he basically says the third one is that the root of all this is a executive branch secret treaty with one or more alien groups. And so this, again, it could fit with the other ones, but you know, the other ones could be completely not true. And it could just be that the U S government met with aliens and the executive branch created signed a secret treaty with them. And uh, this would be, I think this goes back to the Eisenhower theory, the theory that Eisenhower in 1953 met face to face with aliens and signed this treaty. And, you know, we don't know what the terms of the treaty were. There's a lots of theories, but if the, um, the, I mean, the story is that this treaty, it set the aliens, well, the story is that Eisenhower actually met with two different alien groups and he chose one group insisted that we end, uh, end our nuclear weapons program. Um, uh, but he didn't go with them. He went with the other group, which the story is kind of that that was the reptilian group. And that this other group said, you can go ahead and build your nuclear weapons. We'll even give you some technology. You can try to reverse engineer, but you just have to give us permission to abduct people once in a while okay. for, you know, gentle medical uh evaluation you know and wow. they signed that treaty that's the theory i see yeah. i see yeah wow well yeah, so, that that could be yeah. <laughs> yeah 
So the the legal implications of that one, this third the treaty thing, is that one, no treaty is legal unless two thirds of the Senate ratifies it. Okay. And so he's saying if this third scenario is the deal, then uh, basically we're looking at a treaty that is illegal and not Ooh. ratified by the Senate, unless unless it was ratified by the Senate in secret or something. And that's a secret too. Right. <laughs> oh, no. Um. And he said there's, and then he made an interesting point. They might be getting around the Senate ratification by saying that the president has the authority to negotiate treaties for a period of time without any communication to the Senate before he brings it for ratification. So it might just be they've been in an 80 year time period Holding of period. Wow. Uh, treaty negotiations. Oh, oh man. Okay. Well, so do you think this could still come up then for the for the ratification, like do it right? <laughs> oh, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. They could be, yeah. Maybe they could just be like, oh, we've it's, it's, all this has been going on under the veil of ongoing treaty negotiations, which is in the authority of the executive branch. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you have any attraction to any one of these so far? I mean, that you've you've mentioned the. Well, I mean, they NBA technically quote. all could be true. They all yeah. do kind of fit together. <laughs> uh huh. It's really, but they also could each individually be true and create, you know, and it kind of depends which one happened first, you know, because it's mm. like sort of a domino effect. If it was first, you know, I mean, and again, he's sort of just looking at like what legal framework do we need to use to rectify the situation? Mm -hmm. um, so he's a lawyer. And so he's trying to figure that out and trying to, you know, he's sort of trying to train everyone in the class to help be sort of an army of educated activists and advocates to try to help figure out how to solve this, how to elect the right people to Congress and the Senate. Yeah. Boy, that's, that's, yeah, boy, this is, this is a long process. I mean, this has been going on since the since the whistleblowers did their hearings in Congress uh, mm. last summer. And you, we're still not hearing that much about it, are we? I mean, not certainly not on primetime television. Um, well, there's, there's whispers that another hearing is going to happen. OK, we'll see. Yeah. OK. So um, executive branch, and then is that that one? And then there's another one? Yep. The the next one, num theory number four, is that it's not, an, it's not just an executive branch U.S. treaty with aliens. Instead, it's a multinational treaty between ETs and uh, a bunch of nations. So that he, and so he's just saying that's very, that's a different legal setup. Again, if it's like, 20 nations have signed on to a treaty with aliens. It's no longer within the scope of the U.S. only. It's now a United Nations, perhaps, or something like that, has signed treaty with aliens. So it's a multinational situation, and it's just more complicated to try to like figure out how we could um, deal with that. He's like, it could be a multinational treaty involving the USSR, China, India, France, Germany, and all of these agreements um, and this agreement, this treaty may involve underground bases in multiple, multiple nations. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, and that's basically, so, I mean, that would include China, right? Did you mention China and what about, well, yeah, I mean, we don't really yeah, know, but that's what he's, he's saying. Yeah. It could be, it could be a multinational treaty. Um, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. It totally does. Um, I'll, go, I'll go with that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I, I mean, I should add that the first, the theory of treaties definitely involves underground bases, joint underground bases built for aliens and humans. That's part of the, uh, that's part of the story that's come out about it. Okay. 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 Yeah. Are right, you ready for the fifth theory? I, I'm ready for the fifth one, I think. <laughs> okay. The fifth theory is that. Basically, the fifth theory is saying it doesn't really matter which human group made what agreement with the aliens because the aliens are so much more powerful than humans 
that it's really completely in the hands of the aliens. Basically, the aliens bullied the world um, governments and the elites to basically do what they wanted. Yeah. Um, and it's really, it's an interesting way to look at it because it's like, yeah, it's that the, it's basically just saying it's not, the humans are not in charge. That it's just a, it's a complete facade that there's humans at the top of this pyramid and at the top of the pyramid are aliens. And so the humans at the top are just like basically being controlled and threatened by aliens. The aliens are saying to them, we can kill you. We can kill all of humanity if we want. So they basically say to the humans at the top, come up with some method of doing our bidding, do whatever we say. And they basically, they basically they've had no choice. You know, there's not, no human has been, up, no, it's like Truman wasn't up there at the top being like, oh, I'm going to steal this $1.2 trillion. Mm. Basically, Truman was up there being like, if I don't do this, the aliens are going to wipe out humanity. And so mm. it was, and so if, if it turns out that it's, um, I mean, and also another way to look at this is like the aliens, they may have their own um, legal framework uh, that, you know, earth and humanity is basically just a, a small, perhaps prison controlled environment inside of the alien framework. So it's like, it doesn't matter what we do within our laws and legal system here, you know, the, the U S exists by virtue of perhaps some sort of just permission from the aliens. And then, so he's just like, if it's, if it's that kind of situation, again, it, it's sort of, again, it completely changes how us as humans have to think about how do we ever resolve the situation? I mean, maybe instead of, yeah, it, boy, yeah. oh boy. I mean, it's becoming so clear just before our, our talk today. Um, I was listening to a YouTube uh, video. Let's see if I can remember the name. Okay, here it is. Anunnaki, Mankind's Forgotten Creators Who Genetically Created the Human Race. This is a YouTube video. It's about 26, 27 minutes. Um, and there's it's it coming out in the science. I mean, the Sumerian, as they decipher the Sumerian uh, tablets, um, the story is coming together that we are the product of genetic manipulation. And I mean, how can they be talking about that during, you know, we're talking about Sumerian tablets. Uh, they gave a date to, you know, over 200,000 years ago. Um, oh no, the tablets were not, they were, the tablets were talking about 200,000 years ago that we were genetically modified. I don't know that the Sumerian tablets go back that far, but, um, and it all kind of coincides with uh, biblical things. And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to go with the, if, if we're just a genetic project, we really don't have any control over what's going on. They probably just come back on occasion to check out how their Petri dish is doing and make adjustments. <laughs> Yeah. And that, it's crazy to think like that. Wow. But this yeah. is what the science is. This is what the archaeology is pointing to. How crazy yeah. is this? Yeah. Yeah. And he tried to, he tried to, you know, he was trying to stay away from the theories that go back to the ancient aliens theory, ancient astronaut theories, not yeah. because he doesn't believe it's worth investigating, but he's trying to frame this and just like, let's assume this all goes back to 1940 to give us a framework to, you know, or 1933, if that's sort of the starting point. But if the thing is, like you said, that might not be the starting point at all. It just, mm -hmm. this might've started before humanity even existed. And they've always been here, always been more powerful than us and always been manipulating the elites on, of humanity. Um, now, if this is true, the, and, and, um, and these ancient tablets are pointing to this, what they're basically saying is that they there is on um, Enki and Enlil, right? So Enki is the one that uh, it's it's gonna get. I don't. I'll try and cut this down to a minute. <laughs> Enlil is the one who who is the big in charge guy, right? He's the number one. He's using us for uh, slavery for whatever he's wanting. You know, he's he's not 
trying to do the best for us. He's trying to get what he can out of our existence. He, that's what we were created for. And then Enki comes along and sees some potential in us and he wants to uh, introduce genetically some genetic material that will help us or at least give us the option or ability or something to have a higher consciousness because Enki was supposedly the one that that uh, gave humanity farming and mathematics and language and astronomy and all that stuff that makes us human uh, in a more sophisticated way not just blunt labor um, and in that he gave us the potential for a much more expanded consciousness and I think that if we can attain a higher consciousness, the individuals who can attain higher consciousness are treated differently by, by uh, the Anunnaki. They would be set into a different category, um, kind of like separating out the lab mice, you know. <laughs> um, so that's why I think at this point in, in, um, in this life that we're living right now, we're being visited again. Maybe they've always been here, but they're making themselves more known. And we're finding out more just through archaeology and all. And that, that, that they are trying to encourage us, or at least Enki and his people. Uh, and we don't see them. This is a, a kind of a psychic thing going on in people who are able to quiet their mind. The goal is, he wants, this is what I believe, the goal is to create kind of a heaven on earth and to do that, to have full knowledge and to be able to overcome suffering. That seems to be a really big part of this, that suffering is optional, that we feel pain. Pain is going to be there. It's an intense energy exchange in the body's neuron system. But the suffering is kind of an elaborate uh, building up uh, embellishment in the mind through thinking and and I think they're trying to manipulate that so that that's not so much of a problem um, yeah so I do think that we are an ongoing experiment and I and I think that's what they're doing trying to bring more of a accommodating life that's not suffering so that, and I think that the reason for it, I think, is so that the gods themselves can come and, you know, vacation here without suffering. <laughs> mm. um, so uh, that's what I see, and so, and it's all tying into to what you're saying. And I do think they are in charge totally. Well, do you think there's more than one faction of aliens? Yeah, there's two, according to the Sumerians. There, there's two main ones, and I'm sure there's others that are uh, doing other projects. But the two main ones, according to the Sumerian tablets, and, and people can read a lot about this through uh, Zachariah Sitchin, who kind of broke open this whole floodgate of information and, and has his interpretation. His, some of his details are being, um, you know, challenged, but... But generally, you can't challenge the fact that the Sumerian tablets are saying that there were two gods. They called them brothers. And, and uh, Enlil was the one who was the bigger brother, and he's the one that's really in charge of manipulating all of humanity for his benefit or, you know, whatever. And then there's the, the other one, Enki, who wants to develop human beings into a higher consciousness without suffering, which, which is basically creating a heaven on earth. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, at least two factions. Yeah, I wonder if, you know, because uh, the Farsight Institute, the remote viewing group that uh, eventually we're going to get an interview with one of their remote viewers that had to be rescheduled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they say that there's there's two groups. There's the uh, sort of malevolent aliens, which they say are primarily, you know, mostly reptilians. And that then there's be, a that would be the Enlil faction. Yeah. And then they say there's a uh, a, a friendlier, a nice, a more enlightened group, um, the good aliens that is trying to help humanity. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's I wonder if they're 
Enlil and Enki are, you know, it's just a metaphor that they use saying that they were brothers and they're really just two powerful alien species um, that might not there be are, related are, as brothers. You yeah, know. there are more details. I'm trying to remember. I think they've had the same father, but different mothers or something like that. Yeah. Um, if you want to dig into the details, I haven't dug in too deep, but this is what I'm learning. I mean, it could just be that, you know, all aliens, all life actually is related because it, did have one common source it might be like four billion years ago was the first life on one of these planets evolved and it split several times and you know the reptilians are one branch and the uh the galactic federation or the orions or the pleiadians i don't know or another branch and humanity is one of these newer branches that was created um Oh, and one of the things that, that I was listening to toward the end of this video I just watched, they were talking about the, the Iraq war back in uh, 2003 when we invaded Iraq. What was the name of that? Operation Iraq Freedom or something. Yeah. And during that invasion, uh, which I remember clearly, they, had, they, they were talking about the... Um, ramsacking and robberies throughout the museums of Baghdad. Yeah. And uh and the things that were stolen were the uh cuneiform tablets from ancient Samaria that actually describes more in more detail um the whole the whole where we came from and 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 so it's a huge loss to to our history. Uh, that, and for what reason? Why would why would anybody steal clay tablets? That this was they suspect this was not just you know guys looking for to make a buck. You know, this was a very sophisticated theft, and these tablets were stolen that actually told the real story of our history. What yeah. a loss! Well, I mean, if if aliens have been here since ancient times and they've been say occupying parts of earth and there were previous advanced civilizations here uh then that could mean that there are spots you know places on earth that have incredibly important significance they might have entrances to underworld cities and so it could be that there's been a secret uh, a secret under um you know, uh, a parallel storyline that's been that's behind many of the wars that have gone that, that have been going on. They've really been a fighting about possibly some sort of ancient alien locations or artifacts or technology. And, you know, it's like they make an excuse for a war against Iraq, but perhaps there's something there that is that the MJ-12 group or the CIA, and, and they've really realized they want that, and so they find a way to justify the war to go get it. it same but, thing, you know, I think. I totally agree with you. And and even back then, I was thinking, something's fishy here. And then when I saw them ransacking the museums, I thought, that's it. Because I first read about Zachariah Sitchin, uh, his work with, with the tablets and everything, probably over 20 years ago. And so this this was happening right around that time where I was learning about all that. And so when they ransacked the museums, I thought, there it goes. They're going after that information that tells the, the crucial history about the Anunnaki. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what they did. They, they were aiming for the history, for the museum. Something was in there that they needed. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be yeah. it could be alien technology. It could be a Stargate. I've heard, I mean, and maybe. I've heard that, yeah. yeah. I've heard that too. I mean, and I have the same theory about the Vietnam War, about Ukraine, that there might be locations that, I just think there's like a hidden subtext that they're not, that they're tell, not telling us um, what is what these wars are really about. If they're about anything other than just a, a thing to distract humans, there might actually be some key properties that have incredibly profound significance or power. I would yeah. love to, to just know, Yeah, <laughs> you know, for sure. All right. Yeah. So let's go on Now you have six and what else you got there? 
Well, let's see. So the sixth theory is that there is no ET or interdimensional phenomenon. All of this tech and these UFOs are just secret U.S. government tech and that the, the aliens are a cover story to hide. It's a psyop to hide, you know, that we have this technology from our adversaries. So again, that's a, a, another framework that would take a different um, method to resolve because if they're operating uh, without the oversight of Congress, they're violating the law and doing that. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then uh, number seven is that the, the U.S. government is split into two different factions, a pro-disclosure faction and an anti-disclosure faction. And this kind of fits with all the theories, but that the the anti-disclosure faction is basically saying that if the truth comes out, it will destabilize the world because people, ordinary people will lose all faith in governments, nation states, uh, the authority of government, the media, and the power elite will lose their power and they don't want to lose their power. So they're like, you just cannot let this out because too many dominoes will fall. I, I think I think just because we're going into the age of Aquarius, those dominoes are going to fall anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and he 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 said it in a really interesting way. He said, inside of Washington D.C., that there, uh, or I don't know if he knows this for a fact, but he said there is a, a a theory that there are secrets that are considered too big for anyone to let out, and there's sort of a, an agreement you know, a secret agreement between the power elites that, you know, it's like you, you categorize a secret, you know, there's like some scandals you can let out, but some scandals you have to candle inside the family, you know, <laughs> inside the family of the power elites. And this, uh, the truth about UFOs is, is one of those secrets that's considered inside the family, but there's, they're trying to figure out a way to let out some of the truth about UFOs without pulling on the thread that lets all these other secrets come out, which I'm sure includes like the Kennedy assassination. Yes. Very you know, probably 9-11, the, the wars and the money that's been stolen. Just the, uh, uh, the yeah. And it is going to destabilize I mean, the world. It, what do you think it would do if we knew everything? I think what they're right. They're going to lose their power. Yeah. The people are, are going to be ready for a revolution and to rebuild earth in a new way. And that I think is what needs to happen. So I have no, you know, I don't have any fear, but I, I just don't want, I don't want people to have, die in massive, massive riots and, you know, no, no, horrible. I think, well, it's already happening. People are beginning to look at decentralized social structures. Um, there's a guy that uh, just wrote a book about it a couple of years ago. I can't remember. It's called something like how to structure decentralized societies you know, getting ready for, you know, because whenever something gets too big, it, it ends up imploding like a deck, like a house of cards, historically and everything, you know, it's always been like that, like the flower reaches its peak, and then it decays, right. So at some point, this big, you know, global uh, structure, complex uh, net of whatever we're living in, kind of caves in and it is kind of rotting right now <laughs> um, and people are getting ready for more independent uh, you know decentralized smaller structures um, but still if we can plan it all ahead of time then we don't have to see everything collapse you know we don't we can maybe still keep our internet and all that uh, so there's al already a lot of work going in that direction of how to how to take care of ourselves without, you know, these grand overlords. And we'll see, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, if you let a, if you let a whole bunch of lab mice out onto the, you know, the highway, I mean, what's going to happen? You know, we all might get destroyed and ruined and some of us might be able to survive feral, you know, and, uh, and match in with the rest of nature. So yeah, crazy. Yeah. Crazy well, to think about. I mean, I guess like Haiti, it seems like Haiti is an example of what we don't want to happen on a global basis. It's just falling apart and a warlord is taken over and 
Right. Um, That's why people are trying to be proactive to sort of like, we don't have to give that power to them. We can take that power and put it into our own society, you know, any other structures decentralized that, that we can come up with. So it, it, there are people working on that. If we don't work on it, you're, yeah, it's going to collapse into chaos. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> yep. So I think, and it, that's kind of similar to what uh, he was saying. And, uh, and, and that's my thought too. We need to, we need to basically start building a parallel uh, government for humanity and uh, something that we can trust. And maybe it needs to be, broken up you know, maybe it can't be global maybe we can break up the world into regions and states and but we need we need to start working on a whole new structure because i mean i guess that's one of the things daniel was saying it's possible that the the systems and structures we have in place are just so corrupt so poisoned and corrupt from top to bottom we can't use them to fix them exactly yeah 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 it's a mess um Oh, here, here's this guy's name. I was going to try to pull this up real quick just to, his name is Johanna Givers, J-O-H-A-N-N-A, -N -N Givers, G-E-V-E-R-S, and he's got a website, JohannaGivers.com. He says, how to structure decentralized societies. One, you need um, internet and cryptography, right? Because you're going more into blockchain technologies here. Um, and decentralized law structures, the choice of law, choice of educator, choice of, did I say that right? Adju, adjudicator, adjudicator, and choice of enforcer, and then decentralized production, decentralized finances, I won't go into all of it. But he's got it all laid out so beautifully. And he's written a book, so I'm going to recommend it. So there, that'll help people get a start on constructing their own societies. We got to unplug from this mess. Yeah. And you know, I think we're just going to have to use Bitcoin as the. Oh, uh, yeah. As he the says that decentralized change. currency and, and um, decentralized contract systems. And not yeah. just Bitcoin. I mean, I think actually uh, it's kind of a tangent, but. I mean, Bitcoin, I think, is the foundation of the this decentralized revolution to break away from the control of uh, governments and their currency manipulation. But you know what I think also is really key is the alter altcoins, even meme coins like Dogecoin, Shiba and Whiff and all these other ones that are going crazy mm. because yeah, if, they're going, everything's going crazy right now. Yeah, because right now, you know, uh, with with the ETFs launched and BlackRock and lots of the global elites finally realizing they have to just try to buy as much Bitcoin as they can because it's going to be the most valuable asset on earth. The, the funny thing is if, if the whole world wakes up tomorrow and realizes that BlackRock and all these uh, governments and, and one percenters have been just manipulating humanity since the beginning of time and just hoarding trillions of dollars from them and then and we, and simultaneously they wake up and they realize oh oh no blackrock now owns like five percent of all bitcoin we could all decide to just shift to dogecoin and just like right. you could just shift to dogecoin and then <laughs> right, if they like right. chase like that we could shift again we could all, we could shift to shiba inu or something mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. yeah I mean, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna go through some pretty wild adventures and i you know, I'm very feeling very positive, actually. Uh, there were first there was a lot of fear, you know, everything's collapsing. But now I'm seeing a lot of, um, you know, highly intelligent brains stepping up to the plate. To, it's like building safety nets. And, and the more we can do that, the more we can actually just create our own paradise. You know, we, we don't have to be enslaved. So anyway, yeah, I've got I've got confidence in humanity. We just got to put our heads together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I'm optimistic too. I mean, I I do feel like the structures need to be. I mean, I actually think we can use the structures in place to fix the structures in place. This I think this election season is very important. You know, I I am hoping that everyone realizes we do not have to choose between uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. I I am right. hoping that this is a turning point. Earth and they realize 
it's the two party system is completely corrupt and controlled. And we have, you know, I know people think that he's some people think he's a nut job, but I actually think RFK Jr. is a good guy. And I think he could really help, you know, to fix things going on. I, he's not perfect, but he seems to honestly be trying to figure things out. And uh well, you know, he's got the inside view, for, for all going all the way back to his uncle. Um, pr he's got that inside understanding of, of the CIA and and the whole corporate capture dynamic, how how the um, you know the the corporations have managed basically to capture the military system. They kind of uh, using the Pentagon as a storefront or something and. Eisenhower gave a warning, you know, at his farewell speech, you beware of the military industrial complex. And Kennedy has that inside understanding. He's been through it with his fa his uncle, his father. So he's coming from a, a different background altogether. And, I, and yeah. I think you're right. I mean, they're trying to, you know, kick him out, out of the playing field here. Um, but people are seeing that he's coming from a, a experienced deeper understanding of, of the secrecy and the corruption and the buyouts and revolving doors. He sees it. Yeah. So, yeah, I yeah. agree. Uh, he's got my vote. Yeah. I've listened to many of his interviews and I just like, you know, I think he's, he's really trying to be honest and figure out things and he'll sit down with you for like two hours and talk about stuff. And, um, I, you know, it, it's a little, I don't know. There's something weird about Israel and, you know, his, there's just, I mean, something weird about the state of Israel and nothing, nothing. I'm not saying anything about Judaism, um, but there it's, it's kind of, there's something weird going on with the history of Israel and the state. I, I think, you know, just like the U S government, you know, is highly corrupt. I'm concerned that the government of oh, Israel. I, I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even the Orthodox Jews are, are, you know, not in agreement with this invasion of Gaza. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's ju just the top, the top government that's doing this. It's not the Jewish people. It's not even the Orthodox Jews. So, I mean, and I don't want to say everybody, maybe there are a lot of Jews um, that are against uh, or, or, supporting Gaza uh, being basically wiped out. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's, I agree. It's the top people that are doing this. Yeah. And so it's just, it's just sort of weird how RFK Jr. is, he seems to have unquestioned support for the the war. And, you know, and so I just hope he is, I don't, I just don't know what's going on with that. I, I wish he had a little bit more nuanced perspective on what's going on with Israel and Palestine and Gaza. It, yeah. it, it's, it's odd that sometimes Biden is putting out statements that sound more nuanced than RFK Jr. about that conflict. But, you know, I thought about yeah. this because when he was out, he's been stomped a few times for for supporting, um, supporting. He, they think he's supporting this, but he says he's supporting the Jews. I, I don't. I don't hear what what maybe you're hearing that he's supporting the war. Uh, maybe I need to listen some more for that. He's, you know, he's just, uh, you know, he's supporting he, the Jewish people, but I, I didn't hear that he was supporting the war. I don't know. I mean, it. I don't know what's going on over there, and I just, but I, but even with my like a little bit of confusion about it seems, you know, about his perspective on that conflict, I still trust him to. I'm just hoping. I mean, you got. I'm just, we're so desperate to find leaders we can trust, and everything e on every other topic. I'm like, this guy sounds like he is trying to understand stuff, and he wants to make the world a better place. And you know, uh, and he's intelligent. And I mean, anyways. And I think you know. I I mean, I think he's a threat. He is a threat to the two party threat. system. He's he's a threat to the whole corporate, um, mil you know, not just the military. Yeah. Uh, industrial complex, but all the corporate capture, the corporate capture of our FDA, yeah. you know, CDC. I mean, yeah, it's it's I mean, ugly right now. 
And we gave Trump a chance. He got into he got to be president. He could have revealed the truth about the JFK assassination. He could have revealed the truth about aliens, and he didn't. He got in there, and instead, whatever reason, he didn't reveal the truth. I mean, the president has the power to release the full JFK assassination files. And you know what? Trump didn't have the guts to do it for whatever reason. You know who will do it is a guy whose dad was killed by the CIA. Absolutely. RFK and uncle. Release, yeah, just that alone is reason to elect him. Elect someone that will just tell us the truth about the RFK and JFK assassination. Because I think the dominoes are going to fall from that. The dominoes, right. it's going to lead to aliens. It's going to lead to MJ-12. It's going to just start to unpack everything. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah big. Woo. All right. Uh, well, we'll see. I mean, do you think one of these days just somebody's going to pull the linchpin and the whole thing is going to come out? <laughs> or do you think I mean, this is going to be so controlled that we'll barely notice it? What do you think? I don't know. I don't know what's going to. It seems like this election season should put so much pressure on it. You know, I'm just waiting. If if RFK Jr. Actually, I don't even know if there's a debate of any sort. If there was just one debate and they had RFK Jr. on stage and, you know, I mean, if they had Biden and Trump, I don't think Biden will participate in any sort of debate. But if there was if there was a debate stage and um, I mean, you know, it was sort of just it was fascinating during the Republican debates. There was one question about UFOs and aliens. But it was really early on, and Chris Christie just sort of gave a joking response to it. And, and you know, they could have asked it again. It's really, it's yeah. like, but I think they're waiting for a, a bigger stage to really mm -hmm. ask that question. And I think if you ask it, it could just start to, it could start to rip things open. Okay. Well, or if you so, ask. Yeah. Yeah. If it's going to get ripped open, I would imagine it's going to happen during this election year. Yeah. Yeah. Has to. <sighs> My goodness, Matt, you bring so much to the table. <laughs> um, so seven, okay. Do we, and you couldn't, you didn't find eight. Um, yeah, I don't have an eighth one okay. written down. I think you know maybe some of them sort of overlap in uh, some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they Please. a lot of them do seem to like just fit together. Yeah. Yeah, and they were sort of, and you know, Danny sort of goes on these little tangents. He was talking about how. Um, you know, how Kirkpatrick could, you know, get away from prosecution from his misinformation because there, there is a law, something, some law, one, two, three, three, three executive order that says it's illegal for anyone in the U.S. government to do misinformation. But the law or the executive order has zero enforcement mechanisms, so they can just do it and there's no way to get them in trouble for it. So. Yeah, see, the, the whole thing is not structured correctly. I mean... Yeah. We've got a lot of foxes guarding the hen house, you know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, a good dear. way to put it. Ah. Yeah, I mean, you bring so much to the table. My mind is just buzzing. So, yeah, let's leave a minute to meditate before the end here. So. Yeah, yeah I'm, re I'm ready if you are. Are you? Okay, yeah. Yeah, Boy, yeah you, you bring so much information. And it's not just information. It's really just a way of looking at our our identity, our history, our who we are, it's pretty mind-blowing. And sometimes we just need to settle in. Yeah. Well, I think it's great uh, debriefing with you. Oh, yeah. This is good. All right. Let's, let's just take a breath. And feel our feet on the floor. And just be in this place of Gosh, we just don't know who we are. Isn't this amazing? It's confusing, maybe frightening for most people. Can we sit with that? Can we sit in this place of, I don't know? Because when we can let go and be in that place, it's really an act of courage because you're letting go of fear. So let's just be right here, courageously, in our hearts, feet on the floor, take a breath, and just admit we don't know. And yet we're still right here, right now, breathing. 
We're not even really running the show at all. We've got trillions of cells that are each one doing its work. We have thousands of enzymatic exchanges happening in our liver and our intestines. We don't know who's doing that. How, how did they learn how to do all that? So really we don't know, we don't know much. And everything we think we know is just that, it's a thought. What we do know is we're right here, right now, breathing in and breathing out. We can feel the palms of our hands, we can feel the life force in there. And just doing a quick body scan, you can sense your eyeballs in your sockets and the tongue in your mouth. Everything seems alien. And yet it's all working together. Just follow a couple of breaths all the way from the beginning to the top and the top back down to the beginning. Breathing in and breathing out. And all is well. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Have a great week. You too.